very good evening to you and welcome to Primetime News. I'm Nicola de Zoiza and here are your headlines. Supreme Court reaffirms death penalty on Duminda Silva and three others. Arjun Loisius and Kasun Palisena further remanded. Appeal Court rejects revision application. Parliament approves three representatives from civil society to the Constitutional Council. Who's the owner of the Hong Kong bank account with $22 million? Who is trying to sabotage FCID investigations? An appeal filed by former parliamentarian Duminda Silva and three accused was dismissed by the five-judge bench of the Supreme Court today. Duminda Silva and three others accused filed an application against the death penalty imposed by the High Court after they were found guilty for the indictments filed over the killing of Bharata Lakshman Premachandra and three others. The first accused, Police Constable Anuratushara Dimel, was acquitted of all charges by the bench comprising of Chief Justice Priyasad Depp, Justices Buanika Alvihare, Nalin Pereira, Priyanta Jayawardena and Vijit Malalagoda. Thereby, the Supreme Court reaffirmed the death penalty imposed on Duminda Silva, Srinayaka Patrinagate Chaminda Ravi Jainath, alias Demetakoda Chaminda, and Lisanayaka Mudian Selage Sarath Bandara. The Attorney General filed 17 indictments against 13 defendants for shooting dead by the Lakshman Premachandra, Damita Darshana Jaitilaka, Jalaldeen Muhammad Azim, and Manuel Kumaraswamy on the 8th of October 2011 on the day of the local government elections in Himbutana, Angoda. Following an extensive trial, High Court judges Padmini M. Ranavaka and M. T. B. S. Morais sentenced the defendants to death. The verdict was divided when the president of the trial at bar, Judge Shiran Gunaratna, delivered his judgment acquitting all 13 defendants from all charges filed against them. On the 8th of September 2016, Justice Padmini Ranavaka, with consent of Justice M. T. B. S. Morais, acquitted eight of the 13 defendants from all charges. Court issued the death sentence to former Colombo District MP. Them in the Silva and four others. The Court of Appeal dismissed the revision bail application of Arjun Aloysius and Kasun Palisena, stating the petitioners had failed to satisfy the court to invoke revisionary powers of court under the Criminal Procedure Code. Considering the arguments placed before court over the question of law under the Public Property Act, the court held that the current stage of the magisterial inquiry is premature to consider on charges under the Public Property Act, since still there were no specific charges levelled against suspects in a high court. Thereby, the court refused to issue notices on Attorney General as the respondent of the application and decided to dismiss the application based on the reasons set out in the judgment. Colombo Fort Magistrate Lanka Jairatna rejected to release 1 billion rupees belonging to Perpetual Treasuries Limited in the central bank's RTGS system, existing since prior to the controversial bond scam. The beneficial owner of Perpetual Treasuries Limited, Arjun Aloysius, and its CEO, Kasun Palisena, were further remanded until the 25th of October. The duo were produced before Fort Magistrate Lanka Jairatna this afternoon when the case filed by the Criminal Investigation Department over the Central Bank Treasury Bond Scam was taken up. Wasantha Samira Singha, the convener of the Voice Against Corruption organization, convened a media briefing today. FCIDK Pradhania. In December 2016, the head of the FCID makes a visit to Hong Kong to gather information for the investigations taking place over financial fraud that had taken place here in Sri Lanka. The information relates to 22 million US dollars in an account with HSBC, the details of a company and its board of directors and information about the money. This is not a small account. The account has 3,740 million rupees in it. The money did not come from thin air. These monies are the commissions generated from the deal struck by the Rajapaksa family regime. These are the bribes of those deals. The New York Times exposed the $7.6 million given by a Chinese company. We are in possession of the bank account as well. We have information on the board of directors and the link to the Rajapaksa family as well as the amount of money in the accounts. The date here is listed as the 20th of December. What I have in my hand is a copy of the account balance sheet. This was brought to Sri Lanka by Ravi Vaidya Lankara. It's been two years since it was brought to the country. Using the Right to Information Act, we questioned what action was taken against those linked to the 22 million US dollars. We have not received a response as yet. The company is called Red Ruth Investments. It has a DVI account. It is in the British Virgin Islands. There are three directors for this company. Two of them are Chinese. One of them is Sri Lankan. 
Who is this person? After Mahindra Rajapaksa's defeat at the presidential election on the 9th of January 2015, Rane Vikramasinghe takes another person along with him to meet Mahindra Rajapaksa. What we have here are the details of the Rajapaksa family finances with accounts in Dubai, China and other countries including Hong Kong. This person worked relating to those accounts. This here is the money of the Rajapaksa family. There are many more accounts. There is a World Diamond Service account with the Hong Kong Bank. Money was sent from the account of Red Ruth. It contains around $32,000. There is another one called Sin Screen Enterprises. It contains $44,000. Another in the Sin Screen Enterprise Group worth $7,140. US dollars. There is another called Hafsa Traders. The account was closed on the 25th of December 2015. The reason is because the money that came from the account have been transferred to accounts that were opened from the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank. Some are DVI accounts. After the information was brought to Sri Lanka, President Maitri Pala Sirisena, Rani Vikramasinghe, the Inspector General of Police, the Minister in Charge of the Police were aware of this. US representatives came here for the investigations. The US team was here to support the investigation. They met with Rajit Sena Ratna and informed him cases need to be filed in Hong Kong and measures need to be taken to recover the money. Why are these matters not being investigated and why is it being delayed? Measures need to be taken to bring the 22 million US dollars in Hong Kong to the country. The law needs to be enforced on the evidence gathered from Hong Kong. If not, the people need to know why the investigations are swept under the carpet. They can uncover if this belongs to Basil Rajapaksa, another Rajapaksa or anyone else in the family. They are not investigating it because these matters are being used as political tools. <laughs> The sergeant attached to the Thebuana police in Kalutara, who protested against the release of a seized lorry transporting sand with his weapon, had expressed the following views on social media. The sergeant attached to the Thebuana police in Kalutara expressed his objection against the release of a seized lorry transporting sand through aggressive behaviour in public. He was later arrested and produced before the court and currently released on bail. <laughs> I seized the lorry transporting sand at 4.30 a.m. that day as the lorry driver failed to produce any license. His sand permit had expired and terms of the sand permit had been violated with no specific time recorded. I had the power to seize this vehicle on fair grounds of suspicion as the lorry driver did not even have his driving license. He had been involved in an accident and his driving license was held by the magistrate court in Ugegoda and a temporary document had been provided to him. That had expired on the 26th. When I seized the vehicle, the driver identified as Vikram came and threatened me. They said that two officers from the Kaltura police were suspended after seizing this lorry and I was also warned of such a possible suspension. And I was also warned of such a possible suspension. According to law, stamped documents cannot be opened by me or even the OIC. Subsequently, I was ordered to provide a statement on that matter to the ASP of Matugama. When I met him, he shouted at me in an indecent manner. <laughs> The Balangura Urban Council meeting that was held today ended in a brawl. The fight broke out between the previous and the current chairman of the council. Chairman Chamika Jaimini Vavegedra presided over the council meeting that was held this evening at the Balangura Urban Council. In opposition to several problems, including the fuel pricing formula and plots to assassinate high-ranking officials, members of the Sri Lanka Pudujana Peramuna and United People's Freedom Alliance, who represent the opposition, attended the meeting wearing a black band. This is the situation that arose when the former chairman Nimal Gamini Virasinghe stated that the report presented by the current chairman contains false information. <laughs> The police were summoned to control the situation and the council sessions were postponed by the chairman. Similar situations also arose in the Southern Provincial Council and the Atanagala Pradeshya Sabha.
A fire erupted at a leading clothing store in Palavatta Bhaktaramulla today. It was reported that the building was completely destroyed. The fire erupted at about 11 this morning. The four-storey building has been destroyed from the fire and firefighters worked tirelessly until evening to douse the fire. The fire was extinguished with the help of the fire units from Colombo and the Kote Municipal Council and the Army, Navy and the Air Force. The Sri Lanka Air Force dispatched an SLAF Bell 212 helicopter to douse the massive fire. Our correspondent stated that the fire was completely doused by 4 p.m. Police stated that the cause of the fire is yet to be ascertained and the investigations have been launched. Chief Justice Priyasad Dev will retire from service tomorrow. Today, Speaker Karujaya Surya announced in Parliament the Constitutional Council will convene tomorrow afternoon to appoint a new Chief Justice. In addition, Parliament today approved the three civil society members nominated for the Constitutional Council. The names of three civil society members who are appointed to the council as per the 19th Amendment to the Constitution are Dr. Jayanta Danapala, Ahmad Yusuf and Naganathan Selva Kumaran. Minister Talatat Korala was appointed as the representative of the Prime Minister while Chamal Rajapaksa was appointed to the Constitutional Council as the representatives of opposition leader R. Sampandan. JVP MP Bimal Ratnayaka was appointed to represent the minority parties in Parliament. Earlier, President Maitri Pala Sirisay appointed Minister Mahinda Samar Singh as his representative to the Constitutional Council. Even as of this moment, no one is aware as to how the Constitutional Council functions and what the regulations are. We would like to know what happens when the Chief Justice retires tomorrow. At the party leaders meeting yesterday, MP Dinesh Gunavardhana did not voice any opposition. He was silent all the time and now he's causing an issue. We introduced the 19th Amendment to the Constitution and made the Constitutional Council independent. The people who are under the Rajapaksas were rescued by us. Let's call for a vote. In April 2015, I was the Secretary of the Alliance. There were 142 members of the Alliance and 46 in the UNP. We contributed to pass the 19th Amendment that formed the Constitutional Council. Item number one, it has been approved now. The Constitutional Council was created so that Parliament would have power as a whole, but we have no power. This is the issue we have. We ask for the regulations on this matter. The 19th Amendment is independent. The 18th Amendment was under President Mahinda Rajapaksa. That is the difference. Though Minister Lakshman Kiriala was explosive in his response in Parliament, when journalists posed questions to him, his response was somewhat different. <laughs> Speaking at the two-day Indian Ocean Summit, Deputy National Security Advisor of the Indian Government, Pankaj Saran, said India is committed to fostering a peaceful and stable environment in the Indian Ocean region. Speaking at the same event, former Chinese ambassador to Sri Lanka, Yi Zian Liang, said everyone, every country, has the obligation to safeguard the freedom of navigation. <laughs> The program is hosted by the Government of Sri Lanka, the Global Maritime Crimes Program of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, and the Lakshman Kadirogama Institute of International Relations and Strategic Studies. Issues related to the maritime domain, including economic activity, environmental sustainability, safety and security, and the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea will be discussed in the conference. Sri Lanka desires to develop as a trading hub of the Indian Ocean. To realize this objective, we are investing in port and airport modernization to increase our international connectivity. We are investing in developing highways to connect our ports to the Sri Lankan hinterland. Uh, 
we are making logistics and government procedures more business friendly and upscaling our national exports. However, such aspirations depend first and foremost on sustained external demand through thriving maritime trade. The Indian Ocean economy is projected to grow at 5.8% per year in the 2018-2020 period compared with 3.9 for the global economy, which was just downgraded to 3.6. There needs to be an understanding on the maritime vision for the region, and such a vision needs to be developed through a multi-stakeholder dialogue that includes literal states and major maritime users. How best can countries cooperate to identify gaps in legal instruments that currently exist and build understandings on addressing such gaps? As a maritime nation, the government of Sri Lanka intends augmenting its efforts to promote Sri Lanka's ocean interests. The government's vision is to make Sri Lanka the hub of the Indian Ocean with a knowledge-based, highly competitive social market economy. The blue economy holds much potential for development and growth for Sri Lanka and would therefore be in the forefront of our efforts in the future. Awareness without action leads to despondency and despair. So we are in the days of climate and ocean action. The other thing that we have coming up, fisheries subsidies and the eradication thereof, that's SDG 14.6. Uh, for a country like Sri Lanka, this is very relevant because you have a lot of artisanal fisheries and uh, SDG 14B relates to helping those artisanal fishers get access to markets and resources. And one of the best ways of doing that is to eradicate these harmful fisheries subsidies. Why? Because 80% of those subsidies go to big industrial fleets overseas. So Sri Lanka, we look to you for continuing leadership in this area. More than 90% of India's trade by volume is transported over the seas. We are therefore committed to fostering a peaceful and stable environment in the region. We must not return to the age of great power rivalries. An Asia of rivalry will hold us all back, but an Asia of cooperation will shape this century. You will see that in the years ahead, India will be more engaged as a maritime nation with the Indian Ocean community in a manner that enhances collective prosperity, peace, and security. And in this endeavor, we regard Sri Lanka as a specially valued and important friend and partner. As you know, several years ago, the Chinese president proposed the forum, mutual respect, fairness, and justice, women cooperation. So this, I do believe, should be the principles for the developments the already almost 80 percent of the Chinese trade last year is four trillion dollars must go through the sea lines. I do believe no anyone more concerned about this issue. We enjoy free navigation for so long time. We hope we can enjoy in the future. Everyone, every country has an ob obligation to safeguard the freedom of navigation. Former President Mahinda Rajapaksa made the following statement when questioned about his thoughts on a coalition government today at the Abhya Ramya Narahin Pita. What is the state of discussions with regard to the coalition government? There is nothing like that. Is that story a lie, sir? This is just a suggestion. Until it is done, we wouldn't be aware of it. We don't have much hope for it. Will a discussion be held as a party today? No, no. As a party, we have to decide what to do if such a suggestion does come up. Several reports claim parliamentarian Hirunika Premachandra had siphoned off almost 20 million rupees from the Mahanaguma account and the Financial Crimes Investigations Division is probing the incident. Yet what has actually taken place? News First is now in possession of a great deal of information on this matter.
Yesterday and today, several newspapers reported the Police Financial Crimes Investigation Division is probing a complaint which claimed MP Hirunika Premachandra had taken out 20 million rupees from the workers' welfare account of the contract company involved in the Maganagama program and used it for political and other activities. This letter dated the 17th of March 2016, addressed to the Deputy General Manager of the contract company, was sent by a person named J.J. Vikramaratna, claiming to be the chairman of the Welfare Association of the Maga Naguma Construction Company. According to the letter, a request has been made for an independent audit to be performed as issues have arisen with regard to the income and expenses of the Welfare Society Fund for the years 2014-2015. However, the letter does not mention the name of MP Hirunika Premachandra. The only time her name is mentioned is in the bills issued for a sum of 243,000 rupees to an event equipment supply company located in Navala Rajagiriya during the said time period. It is indeed questionable when claims are made that an investigation is taking place over the siphoning off of 20 million rupees. Though the bills claim the event equipment were ordered under the name of Hirunika Premachandra, there is no mention that she approved these transactions and her signature is not placed on any of the bills. However, an individual by the name of Prasanna Kumar Anisankar had signed and taken out a sum of 243,000 rupees from time to time from the Welfare Society Fund of the Maganagama contract company. The documents even go on to show his national identity card number. The total sum issued for seven invoices is calculated at 243,000 and not 20 million rupees as claimed by certain reports. What is the investigation carried out by the FTID on a sum of 243,000 rupees? As per the law of the country, such transactions are inquired by the Mediation Board. What evidence is present to claim that MP Hirunika Premachandra had in fact taken the money? Is this someone's attempt to destroy MP Hirunika Premachandra's future in politics? A student of Saitam has initiated legal action after the Sri Lanka Medical Council failed to carry out an order handed down by the court regarding Saitam. A notice was issued today to the Sri Lanka Medical Council to appear before court on the 16th of November this year for an inquiry over contempt of court as a result of the SLMC not carrying out an order of the Supreme Court. Dilma Kasundara Suryarachi had filed a petition after she was not registered at the SLMC after the Court of Appeal handed down a verdict on the 31st of January 2016 and it was reaffirmed at the Supreme Court. Legislation have been formed on the basis that SITEM is unable to produce a degree that qualifies to expected standards. However, the court has not ruled that the SITEM degree should be accepted. Have the students who completed their studies and currently studying at SITEM been registered at the Faculty of Medicine of the Kotalawala Defence University? When will they issue the Gazette to annul the SITEM institution? Applications of 874 degree holders of SITEM have been presented to the Kotalawala Defence University along with their certificates of minimum qualification. 514 applicants have already been assessed and registered in the proper manner. Another 360 applicants are currently under assessment. This will be the second group. It was this matter that Andrakumara Disanayaka was talking about. This group of 81 has the complete rights to qualify as doctors subject to approval from the Medical Council and within the laws outlined by courts. Who will accept these students of SITEM as doctors? Will patients go to them to receive medication? Which government department will provide them with jobs? Will the private sector give them jobs? These questions are within scope. However, they have access to a second option. They can join the KDU and qualify as doctors under accepted standards. If they agree to this, then they can complete medical and other studies and pass the relevant examinations. We have given them this opportunity. Applications are open until the 30th of this month. Laws passed in Parliament are superior, isn't it? Yes, there has been no violation of law. The reason is that the degree certificates were issued prior to the court order and an act of Parliament. The final rites of popular singer and comedian Ronnie Leach were carried out this evening at the public cemetery in Mount Lavinia. Ronnie Leach, a popular actor, singer and comedian, passed away in Perth, Australia on the 1st of October. The late singer was 65 years old at the time of his demise and was a father of two children. The remains were placed at a funeral parlour in Burella till 2pm today for public respects. It was then placed at the Christ Church in Mount Lavinia for the final rites. President Maitri Palasiri Sena and former President Mahindra Rajapaksa were present 
to pay their final respects. He was loved by everyone. We were all saddened by his sudden demise. His final rites concluded this evening at the public cemetery in Mount Lavinia. <coughs> During the parliament proceedings today, an argument broke out between TNA MP M. A. Samantiran and UPFA MP Dinesh Gunawardana over freedom to express their views as parliamentarians. That the issue that he has raised, uh, as he himself has said, if a member functions independently, he says that member must have a right to speak in parliament. If he declares himself to be an independent member, that has been the tradition. So long as he remains a member of the ITAK, he must fall by the whip of the ITAK. If he doesn't fall by the whip of the ITAK, he will not be allocated any time. I, I will bring this to the notice of the Honourable Speaker. Shakti has raised a very important issue for, for the second time in the last few months. This is the second time. Honourable Member of Parliament has requested repeatedly an opportunity to express the views as a member of parliament to represent the people who have elected him. Tradition is totally different. But even after being ruled by the chair, the honourable member keeps on making a speech. He is entitled to raise a question of privilege, but not entitled to make a speech like this. Order, order please. I will bring this to the honourable speakers. Order please. Garo Bandhila Gunawadana Mantri Tuma. Point of order. What are you doing? Abadu Mahara Dheera Teen Nevastava Katakaran. The Presidential Commission investigating Sri Lankan Airlines, Sri Lankan Catering and Mihin Lanka Private Limited convened today. Today's evidence was led by State Council Sajid Bandara and Senior Deputy Solicitor General Neil Unambua. It was revealed at the Commission today that the former budget airline Mihin Lanka did not have a certificate of incorporation maintained in the files of the General Treasury's Public Enterprise Department. Since its inception in 2006 until its cessation in 2015, more than 14.5 billion rupees was injected into Mihin Lanka while no proof of its incorporation was maintained by the General Treasury. Further revelations were made at the Commission regarding a 300 million rupee loan which was obtained from the Shippers Development Fund of the Ministry of Ports and Aviation. While it was the first time such a loan was granted by the fund, it was revealed that the decision to use funds from the Shippers Development Account was executed following a meeting headed by the former president, joined by the former secretary to the Treasury, Sumit Abe Singer, and many other senior officials of Mihin Air. This loan incurred a total interest of 37 million rupees, which was later waived off upon the decision of former director general of the Public Enterprise Department, Suren Batagoda. However, no evidence is available indicating approval from the General Treasury. In September 2009, a 158 million rupee loan was issued to Mihin Lanka to settle outstanding dues to LOLC and LOFC. However, these funds were instead used as security deposits for aircrafts, resulting in the Treasury to release an additional 158 million rupees. Between 2006 and 2018, Sri Lankan Airlines has incurred a total accumulated loss of rupees 143 billion. In addition, they currently have liabilities worth rupees 167 billion, amounting to a whopping total of 280 billion rupees. If this money was invested at an interest rate of 1%, it would have bought in a return of 2.8 billion rupees. At 2%, it would have returned 5.6 billion rupees. At 5%, it would have returned 14 billion rupees. At the market interest rate of 22%, it would have returned a whopping 61 billion 600 million rupees. Who is responsible for the downfall of Sri Lankan Airlines? Is it Nishanta Vikramasinghe, the brother-in-law of former President Mahindra Rajapaksha, or is it Suren Ratwatta, the brother of the advisor to the Prime Minister? If you are on Instagram, you can follow our Prime Time News Bulletin on our sister channel Yes101 from 11.55 a.m. tomorrow on IGTV, handle at newsfirst.lk. That's all the news for now. I'm Nicola Dezoza for the News First team. Take care and good night.